says, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Now I want you to flip over to Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 8. There the word of the Lord says this, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Amen. You may be seated all around the building. As I began to look at this idea, this concept of open the eyes of my heart, I began to think about the words of that song. I began to look into the scripture, and I began to see this passage from Acts chapter 26, where God is calling Saul, or Paul, and he says, I am going to call you, deliver you from the Jews and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you, that you may open their eyes to Christ. Free them from bondage and let them see the power that's going to deliver them. I begin to think about that passage and I begin to think about how important it is for us that we open our eyes. I am the parent of two teenage boys. Neither one of them know how to open their eyes. You send them to get something. I don't see it. Well, open your eyes. I was just as bad. My mom used to say, if it would have been a snake, it would have bit you. I said, well, if it had been a snake, I wouldn't have had to look for it. I would have felt it. We go through our lives with our eyes closed. We have our eyes closed to what God wants us to do. We have our eyes closed to the power of His Spirit. We have our eyes closed to who we have become. And we have our eyes closed to those that are around us. We just walk along. I've come by over these next few weeks to talk about the idea that we need to open up our eyes. Not just these eyes these eyes we need to learn to see some things today in particular i want to talk about opening our eyes to see god to see his power to see his anointing to see his strength and his mercy too many times we act like we don't know what god looks like will i go to church but I don't see anything there. Only thing I see when I go to church is Pastor Tommy, and he don't look like God to me. I I, I was I wasn't even thinking about this till just now. But yesterday afternoon, we we put on a movie for a little while. We didn't even watch the whole thing, but the movie, The Avengers. And there is a great line in that movie as Captain America is in a plane. And Thor comes and takes his brother away and and they go to attack and Captain America says, I'm going too. And the other girl says, you better be careful. Said, They're like gods. And Captain America says, there's only one God, ma'am. I'm pretty sure he doesn't dress like that. And, and every time I hear that line, I go, I love that line. We, 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 we know what we think he doesn't look like, but we don't know who he is. We have our eyes closed. Well, no man can see God. Yes, God shows himself to us. And we need to learn what God looks like. As I begin to look at this passage of Scripture in Matthew, it says, Blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they will see God. I want to see God. As I begin to look at that verse, I begin to understand that there is some truth there that we need to break down. The first thing that I see is that we were created 
to be blessed. Boy, that's hard for some of us. No, I wasn't created to be blessed, Pastor. I was created to struggle. I struggle for Jesus. God did not create you and say, I'm going to make you miserable for my glory. We were created to be blessed. Look at Matt, Look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over it, over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, I'm not going to take that verse down quite yet. Look at what that says. That says that when God created man, he looked at them and God himself blessed them. Oh, you don't need me to bless you. You you, you don't need me to speak a word over you. God has already blessed you. God has already spoken blessing into your life. And God said to them, be fruitful. What does that mean? Be fruitful. Fruitful means that you're alive. If you are an apple tree that has no apples, you are a dead tree. If you are an orange tree that has no oranges, you are a sick tree. If you are a banana tree that has no bananas, you go around all day and, yes, we have no banana. I'm sorry. Got sidetracked just for a second. When we are fruitful, we are alive. Jesus says, be fruitful, be alive. Then he says, be fruitful and multiply. When we are alive, we multiply. Spiritually, when we're fruitful, we will multiply. This, mm. Joan Ann and Bradley, I'm trying not to preach our book. But I, I, I'm going to tell you, this, this isn't about, oh, what can I get for me? No, this is about how can I reproduce? we got to move from being receivers to reproducers. we got to quit taking it all in and start giving it all out. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Look at this. Subdue it. We have been subdued by the earth. Mm. Well, now you know you can't build that building there because there is a rare fern that grows there. I actually knew a church that was looking to build a building and they got shut down by the county because there was a rare fern on the property. The plant was more important. Oh, pastor, we, we need to have co- be, be conscious of our environment. You're right. We shouldn't be wasteful. But I got news for you. God blessed me and called me to subdue the earth. God called me to take dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and every living thing that moves on the earth. I'm in charge. Who made you the boss, God? God made me the boss. Why? Because he created me to bless me. He created me to give me things. He created me so that he could love me so that I could love him. I... Yes, I understand and I believe and I stand by the fact that we are created to worship God. We are created to love God. But you need to understand that part of that is that He created us so that He could love us so that we could love Him. He gave us power. He gave us anointing. He gave us blessing so that we can love Him because He's already loved us. We were created... To be blessed. 
when God formed you in your mother's womb, He said, I'm going to bless them. I'm going... When He was forming me in my mother's womb, He says, I'm going to bless him by answering the prayers of his father and I'm going to make him six foot tall and I'm going to give him dark hair and I'm going to give him his mother's personality and I'm going to, and he does all these things that my dad asked for and he built me but then he said but what he doesn't know is years earlier well, a little over a year months earlier he had created somebody else in the belly of another woman and he says, I created this young girl in New Jersey because she's going to match up with this boy in Texas. And nobody knows right now how they're going to get together, but they're going to wind up being friends, and I'm going to bless. I'm going to bless Tommy with Beth, and I'm going to bless Beth with Tommy. I'm going to bless this boy with the gift of gab. And when he's young, people are going to be annoyed at him. And they go, oh. But when he gets older, people are going to willingly sit in seats and listen to him. I still haven't figured that one out. I I was the kid everybody wanted to get rid of. Now people come and listen to me. I'm like, wow. Either God's blessed me or uh, you guys are... uh, said, I'm going to make him what I need him to be. I was created to be blessed. Does that mean I was created to drive nice cars and live in big houses? No! It means I was created to walk in the blessings of God that go way beyond earthly treasure. It goes earth to heavenly obedience. But not only was I created to be blessed, that verse said, blessed is he, or blessed is, is, are they that have a pure heart. Somewhere down the road, I had to conclude to have a pure heart. I had to come to a decision. I'm going to have a pure heart. I'm going to be clean. I'm going to think right. I'm going to act right. The Good News Translation, Psalms, chapter 51, verse 10, reads this way. Create a pure heart in me, O God, and put a new and loyal spirit in me. That translation uses the term pure heart. King James uses the term clean heart. Somewhere down the line, we had to decide we're going to be pure. Can I take just a second here? And tell you we don't go from being created to be blessed to seeing God without making a decision somewhere along the way. It doesn't happen until we decide we're going to be pure. You know what being pure means? It's as Brother Eddie said last week. We decide to live a life of intentional Christianity. Love that phrase. We got a lot of accidental Christians. Ooh, that was a good thing. I didn't even know it. No, we've got to live a life of intentional Christianity. That means when our nature wants to speak out against somebody, our Christianity, our God spirit, our God's heart goes, whoa, 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 whoa. Walked into Walmart. I don't know, last weekend, I don't know, Saturday night, Sunday night, sometime. It was late. Most of you know my love for Walmart. And I walk in, and of their 27 registers, there were two open. And they were lined all the way into the clothes. And I'm I'm rolling my eyes, and I look, and there's my sister standing in line like, Oh! I said, God's going to challenge me in my Walmart stuff, isn't he? And she laughs, and I laugh, and I walk on. I look at Anthony, I go, man, I can't even get mad. There's church people here. 
I've got to be Christian whether I want to or not. Why? Because all of a sudden it was reminded to me, hey, people see you. It reminded me of the time that I was in, in, in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, in the inner city, and I went to the grocery store, and I stood in line, and just before I got there, the lady says, I'm going on break. And, and, and the, the, the devil side of me won out that day. I pushed my cart up into her line with all of its refrigerated stuff. I said, well, you might want to put that stuff up before you leave because I'm out of here. And I turned around in a huff. And, I, and right as I turned around, somebody goes, hey, Pastor Tommy, how are you? And I'm like, oh. Somewhere we got to make a choice. Are we going to have a pure heart or not? We choose more often not to. I love the grace of God. I love the mercy of God. But can I tell you, we play the grace of God like it's an instrument. Oh, well, I'm just not strong enough to say no to that. God will understand. His grace will cover me. Baloney! You want to see God live with a pure heart? Is it hard? You better believe it's hard. Is it difficult? Yes! Is it simple? Uh Uh-huh. You say no to sin and yes to God. You, You quit looking around your life and seeing what can I get away with? And you start saying, how close can I get to God? I'm reminded, illustration I used to use, if you could imagine God being this podium. We need to be trying to get as close to this as we can get. Right now, if I get very close, I may fall in, and there's water in there today. Of course, right now I'm hot. I told him halfway through the service, I may take a dive in because it's hot. But, but I... I want to be as close as God. But you know where we live our life? Playing with grace. Since I took that pulpit out, and I keep moving things around, I keep walking right on the edge of this stage. I know good and well one of these days, it scares me to death that I'm going to go. And I'm going to be laying down there somewhere. The only joy that I have is that every sermon is videoed. And maybe we can win some money. If I fall off the stage, that, yeah, hopefully it'd be enough to cover my broken leg. But, but that's the way we live spiritually. We get out here and we go, yeah, I can, I can do this. I, I, I can do this. I got news for you. When you live out here long enough, you're going to fall. When I was a younger man, I just dove off there. These knees don't dive off of anything. But... Eventually, we're going to fall. And we're not going to get to see God. Because we chose to do what we wanted to do. To live like we wanted to act, live. You see, we've been created to be blessed. But we have to conclude, we have to decide, we have to make a decision to live with a pure heart. That means that we make a decision to forgive we make a decision to love we make a decision to give we make a decision to hold our peace we make a decision to speak life instead of death we speak and make a decision to give hope we make a decision to give mercy we make a decision to put god first And when we conclude to have a pure heart because that we have been chosen to see God, I mean, created to bless God, when we conclude to have a pure heart, we become chosen to see God. Blessed are they who have a pure heart, for they will see God. We have been chosen to see God. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Oh, those of you here Wednesday night, you 
You should be proud of me. I'm using a verse in Romans. I told you, this book, this book, I have a hard time with this one. I have to study and study and study this one. But read this. It says, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see His invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Look at this. For ever since the world was created, when we were created, what happened? We were blessed. We have seen God. Have you seen the mountains? Those of us that went to Montana, I saw some of the most beautiful scenery I've ever seen in my life. We went to, uh, what they call it, Devil's Peak, was it Devil? what they, Devil's Tower. Some of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. And the day we were there, it had been raining a little bit, and the sky had these rippled clouds in it that were gorgeous. That's God's work. That's God's work. Several years ago, some 20-something years ago, I sat in a student center at Lee University. My best friend was sitting across the table, but for some reason I looked over there, and for the first time I went, ooh, ooh, she's gorgeous. That's God's creation. On April the 24th, 1993, she walked down an aisle in a dress. Beautiful hair all Gibson bun, and she looked like she was straight out of 1920. And I went, Oh, she's mine. That was God's creation. I ain't gonna lie to you, she walks by me, I still turn my head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why? Because it's God's creation. You don't make something that pretty by accident. I got news for you. In July, of, in July the 23rd, this coming Tuesday, will be his birthday. In 1996, I held a little bitty four-pound, two-ounce baby in my arms. I thought, wow, he's awesome. I didn't know what he was going to turn into. <laughs> I thought, wow, he's awesome. was God's creation. In May of 1999, I held a huge baby, seven pounds, two ounces. To me, man, Anthony wasn't seven pounds. He was three months old. Like, he's huge. Michael was born ready to eat. And I looked at him, and I thought, from, from day one, I thought, that's mine. He's going to be just like me. And guess what? He is just like me. He's identical. It's scary. I feel sorry for him. I keep telling him. You know what I said a while ago? People used to get annoyed at me until now. I said, just give it some time. What annoys everybody about you right now, they're going to come to you in a few years. They're going to line up to hear you in a few years. You just be patient. And I know I wasn't patient when I was his age, and I know he ain't patient now. It was God's creation. I've seen the sun rise over the Atlantic Ocean. I've seen the sun set over the Pacific Ocean. I've seen the mountains. I've seen the prairies. I've seen the deserts. I've seen the beaches. And they're gorgeous. And they're God's creation. We have no excuse to not understand what God looks like. But can I tell you, it goes deeper than that. Not only did God give us all a creation, God gave us His Word. And when we look at the Word of God, He gives us a picture of who He is. You cannot read the Word of God and not know who God is. Several years ago, there was a father and son duo 
named Aaron and Jeffrey. Or Aaron Jeffrey. And they recorded a song <clears throat> entitled, He Is. And I've taken from that song, and I want to share with you the picture of God through the Word. In Genesis, He's the bread of life. In Exodus, the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, He's our high priest. In Deuteronomy, in Numbers, He's the fire by night. In Deuteronomy, He's Moses' voice. Joshua, He is salvation's choice. Judges, the lawgiver. In Ruth, the kinsman redeemer. First and second, Samuel, our trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, he's sovereign. Ezra, true and faithful scribe. Nehemiah, he's the rebuilder of broken walls and lives. In Esther, he's Mordecai's courage. In Job, he's the timeless redeemer. In Psalms, he's our morning song. In Proverbs, wisdom's cry. Ecclesiastes, the time and season. In Song of Solomon, he's the lover's dream. In Isaiah, he's the Prince of Peace. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. In Lamentation, he's the cry of Israel. Ezekiel, he's the call from sin. In Daniel, he's the stranger in the fire. In Hosea, he is forever faithful. In Joel, he's the Spirit's power. In Amos, he's the arms that carry us. In Obadiah, he is our Lord's Savior. In Jonah, he's the great missionary. In Micah, he's the promise of peace. In Habakkuk and Zephaniah, he's pleading for revival. In Haggai, he restores a lost heritage. In Zechariah, our foundation. In Malachi, he is the son of righteousness, rising with healing in his wings. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he is God, man, Messiah. In the book of Acts, he is the fire from heaven. In Romans, he is the grace of God. In Corinthians, he's the power of love. In Galatians, he is freedom from the curse of sin. Ephesians, our glorious treasure. Philippians, the servant's heart. In Colossians, he's the Godhead Trinity. In Thessalonians, he's our coming king. In Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, he is our mediator and faithful pastor. In Hebrews, the everlasting covenant. In James, the one who heals the sick. In First and Second Peter, he is our shepherd. In John and Jude, he is the lover coming for his bride. And in the Revelations, he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You can't read the Word and not know who God is. You can't read the Word and not see God. We have been created to be blessed so that we can conclude that we need to make the right choice so that we can look and see who God is. I've come by here today to tell you to open up the eyes of your heart. Look around. Get the Word out. I made the statement last week. I'm going to make it again. We need to know more about the Word of God than we know about Fox News. I need to know more what the Word of God says about my future than I know about what USA Today says about my future. I've come by here today to tell you, you can see God. He is in the morning sunrise. He is in the wonderful hillside, rolling hills of northwest Missouri. He is in the painted colors of the sky at sunset. He is in the glaze and the twinkle and the shine in your lover's eye. But you really want to see God? in the Word. He's in the prayer closet. He's in the places that we quit trying to manufacture and we start seeking His face. When we read, when we pray, when we study, when we spend time to celebrate Him.